so good evening then. Uh, welcome to another Macula and Me uh, webinar hosted by me, Colin, the, uh, the Working Age and Young People Service Manager at the Macula Society. Um, I had a month off last month because I was doing something else. I can't remember what I was doing, but I wasn't here. I heard it went very well, though. So, uh, so we're, another one in our series uh, sort of focused on uh, sort of conditions and dystrophies that tend to affect sort of younger people, but we do know now that there are older people um, with, with dystrophies as, as people get older, a bit like me really, sadly, because uh, we can't escape it. Um, so we're joined this evening, as always, by the uh, uh, research manager from the Macula Society, that's Jerry. How are you, Jerry? I'm fine, thank you. Evening, everybody. And and uh, and, the, the, and Jess, as always, my PA is hovering around in the background, uh, just keeping sure everything goes okay. Um, so just if you hear a hear her voice, that's who she is. And I'll, and we've got Gavin Arno as well, who's a senior scientist from Moorfield. So uh, good evening, Gavin. How are you? Hello, Colin. I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll just go through some housekeeping and all that stuff, and then we'll then we'll get on with it a bit. I think so. Uh, so as always, uh, this is a full webinar setting, so you can't unmute or anything like that. So you've got no fear of pressing any buttons and sharing screens and malarkey. So uh, just sort of um, listen. And uh, if you've got any questions, we really want you to get involved. So put the questions in the chat. Um, and as always, uh, Jerry will go through them at the end with Gavin. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, com uh, uh, discussion this evening. Uh, always uh, genomics and genes and things like that is, is always very, very interesting. We learn so much. So um, the uh, this is being recorded as always. So if you have to dash out, or you miss anything, you can watch back um, along with our other webinars, which are on YouTube. And as you may know uh, now that some of these webinars are actually being converted into podcasts. So there's an even other, another way for you to get your, your macula society information uh, about your conditions and, and sort of progressions in research, et cetera, and things like that, which is fabulous. Okay, uh, the only other thing to do is mention that I'm in my office today. Uh, my dog is very tired and he's snoring as I can, as I can hear him. So if you can, that's what that noise is, it's not me. Um, so there we go. So, um, but back to Gavin. So Gavin, uh, really thank you for joining us. Um, this is uh, Gavin Arno. He's a senior um, scientist from, from Moorfields uh, and he works at various clinics, including one in Great Ormond Street, which is great. Uh, so he's going to talk about genomics and all that sort of stuff. So he knows a lot more about himself than I do. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and, and we'll just sort of sit back and listen to what he has to say. So over to you, Gavin. Thank you, Colin. Uh, let me just share my screen, make sure this works. Um, okay, now I need to get you guys back so I can see everyone properly. Okay, how is that? So uh, thank you for the invitation to, to talk to you all today. So uh, uh, as Colin said, I'm, a, I'm the senior scientist at Moorfields Eye Hospital in the genetics department. Um, and I take care of the, uh, the uh, I lead the scientific analysis of, uh, of genetic investigations into, into patients and families from Moorfields. I have a research laboratory where we do um, lots of interesting research looking for new causes of inherited retinal dystrophies next door to Moorfields at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. Um, and I also spend a day a week at Great Ormond Street Hospital in the uh, clinical testing lab where I help with uh, translational projects. That's um, turning research into clinical, um, clinical diagnostic tools. That's the aim of my role there at uh, Great Ormond Street. So we're gonna talk um, about a few things today. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the genetics of, of inherited eye diseases or inherited retinal diseases or dystrophies um, and the state of clinical genetic testing in the UK currently and how it's advancing. So the things that we're doing in research that are changing the way that we're able to understand genetics of uh, retinal dystrophies and, and what that means for the future and what that means for patients and families hopefully but we'll start we'll start with a bit of genetics then so I've got some 
I've got some bullet points here. These are mainly to remind me to stay on subject and not to not to get too carried away with what I'm talking about. So we'll start with talking a bit about, a bit about genetics. So what is genetics? So the the genetics of all of us is is uh, governed by the DNA, which is contained in every cell of our body. So DNA is is the uh, is the, uh, the, the, the molecule that encodes all of the instructions for how to make a person. So all of the proteins that make a cell, all of the cells that make our organs and all of the organs that make our body are encoded by this long strand of DNA. And it's made up of four letters. So the alphabet of the, of the DNA code is A, T, G and C. And so that contains all the instructions we need to make a functional human being. And the, the, the DNA is arranged in genes. So each gene, if you like, is the, is the instructions for a particular part of a cell. So a protein that, that does something in a cell is controlled by a gene. Um, and then the human genome contains all of the genes. And there are about somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes in the human genome. And this is a huge molecule of DNA. So it's three billion letters long, the human genome, um, which would take a long time to type out. I think I read somewhere once that if you paid a, a, a typist to, to, to type out the entire human genome, it would take something like 50 years to be able to do that. So it's a very, very long set of instructions. And it's arranged over our chromosomes. So the chromosomes um, our, divide up our genome, we have 22 pairs of chromosomes and then the sex chromosomes as well as those. So females have XX and males have XY. And so within those three billion letters, um, there are variants. So we all carry lots and lots of natural variation in our genetic code. Um, and some of those are completely normal, in fact, the vast majority of those are normal, but some of those um, cause uh, a problem for a protein, which then causes a problem for a, a tissue or a cell or a, an, an organ. And those are what we call genetic variants. So we all have about 4 million genetic variants from what we call the reference genome. And uh, very occasionally, one of those causes a disease. And those variants are inherited. So when, when uh, two people have offspring, that they each give a copy of their genetic code to their offspring, and, and that's what we call inheritance. So by, uh, by chance, the, uh, the, the copy that's inherited may contain a variant on it, or it may not contain a variant on it. And so um, we talk about inheritance patterns, dominant, recessive, X-linked, and mitochondrial, and that, that basically uh, uh, discusses where those genetic variants are, are held. So in the mitochondrial genome, which is a separate, very, very small piece of DNA that, that's contained in the mitochondria of every cell, those are the, the uh, energy creating the batteries of the cells. It has its own genome. Or whether it's something, uh, a variant on the, the X chromosome and passed from a, a mother to a son, recessive or dominant inheritance. So dominant inheritance describes when one copy of a gene is altered and that causes inheritance of that trait from a parent to an offspring or recessive inheritance where both copies of a gene. So the inheritance is, is one copy from each parent that, that causes a trait or a disease or a dystrophy in that, in that child or offspring. So that's what we mean when we talk about inheritance and, and the different types of inheritance that we see. And so genetic traits or, or genetic disorders are inherited often from our parents or they may be uh, they may have arisen in an individual um, and never been seen before. And so we, we need to better understand um, what these are and how they affect uh, individuals. And so why do we do genetic testing then? So we hear from many patients in, in clinic, many, many patients and families um, that, that knowing the gene name associated with their disease is, is important to them. It's, it's almost uh, 
it's almost therapeutic in itself being able to put a label to what's causing their disease but there's a bit more to it than that we can once we know the gene that causes the disease we're able to assess the risk to family members better understand the inheritance pattern and the risk to, to children and, and siblings and future uh, future families um, and we're able to provide more detailed information of how that gene may be uh, affecting uh, the tissue and how it how it may affect the retina in the future so so what the future may hold for um, your vision or your your um, deterioration of vision so to better understand how that that can have an effect on you and then the most important thing that, that we're all working towards is to be able to develop treatments for, for inherited eye diseases so currently there is one gene therapy licensed for retinal dystrophy it's the Luxterna treatment which is a, a gene replacement therapy for, for the RPE65 gene and what that does is it it contains a, a virus vector that, that has a corrected copy of the gene and we can inject that into the back of the eye, the retina, retinal cells at the back of the eye, um, where it replaces the, uh, the error gene and, and puts in a, a new copy of the gene into the genome so that you can make uh, RPE65 protein and start those retinal cells working again. And that's a, that's a new world. Uh, in terms of therapeutics for, for retinal dystrophies and for, for genetic disease on the whole. And so a key thing to, to understand is that in order to be able to access any kind of genetic therapy, we need to know what the gene is that's causing the disease in, in that patient or that individual. So for, for any therapeutics, the first step is a, is a genetic diagnosis and understanding what gene is the cause of the disease. So next we'll talk about how we do genetic testing. So historically, um, before, uh, before widespread genetic testing, we were only able to study one gene at a time. And so we, we used to do this by a technique called Sanger sequencing. So Frederick Sanger was the, the chap that in, invented this method back in the 1970s. And it enables us to read small pieces of DNA in one reaction in a laboratory, and, and it uses uh, uh, it, now it uses lasers and uh, and uh, fluorescent dyes attached to pieces of DNA to do that. And so I mentioned earlier that the human genome is about three billion nucleotides long, and what this method enables us to do is to read tiny fragments of DNA, about 200 to 500 nucleotides, so 200 to 500 letters in length in one experiment. And if we tried to do that for the whole genome, that would, that would take an awful long time and it would be a very, very expensive method. But then in the late 2000s, um, a new method was developed called next generation sequencing. And it's also called uh, massively parallel sequencing. And, and basically what that enables us to do is to make an array of hundreds of thousands of sequencing reactions all running at the same time and uh, uh, with a huge powerful laser camera to be able to capture all of those different sequencing reactions at once and process that information and turn it into human readable format. So that's that's what next generation sequencing does essentially. And, and what that's enabled us to do is to revolutionize the way that we analyze DNA, the way that we analyze patient DNA, the way that we, the way that we can do research projects around the genetics of rare diseases and, and inherited eye diseases. And we're at the stage now where the costs have come down low enough that we're able to do whole genome sequencing. So all three billion nucleotides in, in one single experiment um, for many, many patients and families. And this is, uh, this is exemplified by the 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK, which, which some of you may have been part of and, and may know a little bit, a little bit about. Um, and the aim of this study was to was to advance the diagnostics of rare diseases and rare cancers in the UK and better understand the genetic causes of rare diseases by sequencing 100,000 
genomes from about 80,000 individuals. Um, and that data, all of that genomic data is stored in something called the, uh, the Genomics England Research Embassy, which is where researchers like me and the people I work with at Moorfields and the Institute of Ophthalmology, we can log into that data and analyze all of those genomes in new and, and uh, novel ways to, to better understand the genetics of rare disease. Um, now, that's all brilliant, and it, it's, it's really advanced our understanding of disease, and we're now able to, to provide uh, a molecular diagnosis for somewhere in the region of about 60% of patients at, at, in the Moorfields clinics. But there are limitations. So there are um, many, many patients who we can't solve with the current technology, and those patients will get a negative test. And that's disappointing for, for, for patients, for families, and, and of course for us as well. Um, and so most of the research in my lab is, is focused on trying to understand those causes of genetic disease in those patients who, who've received a negative test from clinical testing. And so a negative test doesn't mean that they don't have a gene that causes their disease. It just means that we don't yet understand the gene or we don't understand the mechanism of the cause of their disease. And so we're working very hard to, to better understand those. So we know that there are 25,000 genes in the human genome. And so far, somewhere in the region of about 8,000 of those genes have been associated with some sort of inherited disease. And if we look at inherited retinal diseases specifically, we know about 300 genes now that are associated with inherited retinal diseases. But there are more genes that we need to discover. And so we're doing lots of research to try and understand those new genes in the 100,000 Genomes Project data and to bring together different patients and families who may share the same new gene. And it's only large projects like that that give us the, uh, the power to be able to do studies like that. Because as we, as we discover these new genes now, they get rarer and rarer. So all of the, all of the common ones have been found um, and all of the very, very important ones have been found that, that affect lots and lots of people. And the ones that are left to be identified are the ones that affect um, much fewer people across the world. So, so that makes it harder to find those genes and, and harder to find um, patients and families affected by those genes. And then another thing that we're interested in is new mechanisms of disease. So I, I mentioned earlier that, that that the DNA is arranged into genes and a gene makes a protein which has a function in a cell. Now, if we, if we look at that gene in a bit more detail, it's broken up into things called exons and introns and regulatory regions. Now, the exons of a gene are the bits that make a protein. The introns are gaps between those exons. So, so we used to think of those as garbage, as, as just noisy DNA between the important bits. But we're, we're now understanding that those introns are very important in terms of switching genes on at the right time, switching them off again, regulating how much protein is made from that gene and all sorts of things like that. And what we're able to understand a little bit now, but not very well, is that that variants or mutations in those introns can cause disease. And we're understanding how to figure those out, how to understand the effect of those variants by doing functional testing in the laboratory. So we can make those mutants in cells in the laboratory and better understand how those variants affect the gene or the protein or the, the transcription of the gene and so on. And so lots of patients will have this term called variant of uncertain significance, perhaps on their, on their negative genetic report, or, or they may have come across that when they're looking at, at genetic data. And what that means is that the laboratory, the clinical laboratory who did the testing have found a variant, a mutation or an error in one of their genes, but we don't yet understand the impact of that variant. We don't know what that does to the gene and we need to do some work to be able to better understand that. 
And so this is a huge problem across the world for clinical testing laboratories. It accounts for many, many of the variants identified by clinical testing. And it's, it's partly due to very strict guidelines and criteria of how clinical laboratories are allowed to interpret genetic data and how they're allowed to feed that back to patients and families, because getting it wrong is, uh, is obviously something that we all want to avoid. So we have to set the bar very high for proof of whether a variant affects or doesn't affect a protein. And so in the introns, we find lots of different variants that we don't know an effect of. And we're working in my laboratory now to better understand how those affect the way that genes are put together. And so for most retinal dystrophy genes, those genes are only important in the retina. So they only function in the retina, which means that we, we can't study them very easily if we want to look at the protein or if we want to look at what's called the RNA transcript, which is the uh, step between DNA genes and proteins. Um, so to be able to do that from blood, we're using new technology, something called nanopore sequencing, where we're able to uh, look at very, very low levels of these genes in the blood and better understand the effect of variants in the retina. And that's, that's something that's quite new and it's quite exciting for us to be able to, to be part of that. And we're, we're working on that at the moment and working towards writing a paper that will describe how we do that and, and share that with the scientific community. And so another issue, another limitation of genetic testing is that there are genes in the genome that are very difficult to read. They're very difficult to sequence with, uh, with next generation sequencing or Sanger sequencing technology. And this is because they're very repetitive sequences. So the, the GATC um, alphabet that, that makes up those genes is just very, very repetitive in long strings of the same letter over and over again. And that makes it difficult to sequence and it makes it difficult to understand those with, with that technology. And the reason for that is that uh, the uh, next generation sequencing or Sanger sequencing works by sequencing very, very small fragments over and over again, millions and millions of times. Um, to generate the entire human genome. And what we're learning now is, is that we can use different types of technology to be able to read those sequences in different ways. So to be able to, instead of smash the genome up into many, many tiny fragments, if we try and sequence it in fewer, larger fragments, then we can better understand what's happening in those genes. Um, and uh, sorry, so that's that's what we're doing now in our laboratory. We're using this new technology called third generation sequencing or long read sequencing um, or single molecule sequencing. It's got lots of names. Um, and uh, what that enables us to do is to, if you imagine the human genome, the three billion nucleotides as a jigsaw puzzle. Now, if you smash that into uh, thousands and thousands of pieces, it's very difficult to reassemble that. But if you smash it into just uh, a few small pieces, then it's a much easier jigsaw puzzle to piece back together again. And that's essentially the technology that we're using now is, is, is long read sequencing to be able to sequence the genome in fewer larger molecules so that we can assemble it better and understand those difficult to sequence genes. And several of those genes are very important for retinal dystrophy genetics. So a gene called RPGR, which is the commonest cause of X-linked retinal dystrophy, is a very repetitive gene and it's very hard to sequence and uh, it, it needs a special test separate from the, from the uh, current next generation sequencing test that we use for all the other genes that cause retinal dystrophy. Another gene is the opsin array, which is on the X chromosome and it's a string of genes that uh, enable color vision. So these genes are expressed in the cone photoreceptors, enable color vision, um, and variants in those genes cause uh, color blindness, first of all, but they also cause severe congenital cone dysfunction syndromes like Bornholm eye disease and uh, blue cone monochromacy. 
and currently in the UK, it's it's impossible to be able to sequence those genes with the current technology. There are only a couple of labs in the world who are able to do that using uh, very complicated um, cloning and long range sequencing methods. But we're developing a method in our lab to be able to use this new technology to be able to read through the whole opsin array on the X chromosome using these very, very long fragments of DNA and better understand the genetics of those diseases. And so we're doing that with a method called CRISPR targeted nanopore sequencing. And essentially, some of you may have heard of CRISPR Cas9 or, or CRISPR gene editing and, and things like that in the news. And what, what this essentially does is enables us to cut pieces of DNA out of the chromosome. So we use these CRISPR-Cas9 guides. The guides are what, what find a specific piece of DNA. And then the Cas9 is, is an enzyme that cuts that piece of DNA. Now it's used in gene editing um, to be able to correct pieces of sequence in DNA, but we're using it slightly differently. We're using it to cut out genes of interest out of the chromosome and then be able to sequence those using ultra long read sequencing with uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies um, uh, sequencing method. Um, and so that's that's a new method that we're developing in our lab for, for the Opsin array. We're also using it to, to sequence through a gene called ABCA4, which is the commonest cause of macular dystrophy. Um, and many patients um, need uh, family segregation when they have their genetic test. And that's to identify whether the two variants in ABCA4 are on the same chromosome or if one was inherited from each parent. Now that's relatively straightforward in, in lots of cases, but for patients who don't have parents available for testing, that could be a very difficult um, obstacle for their genetic testing to overcome. And so we are also using this CRISPR targeted nanopore sequencing to be able to develop a method where we don't need parents to be able to understand the inheritance of variants in a gene like ABCA4. We can do it all from, from a single DNA test, hopefully. And so that hopefully that will be something that's coming in, in the near future. And with that, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking now. And uh, that's my Twitter ID. If, if you wanna contact me and hear anything more about what I do, or if you're interested to, to ask questions or anything, you can, get, you can get at me on Twitter. Thank you very much. No, brilliant, Gavin. Thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, lots again. I love these ones because I learned it, you, you just sort of pick up other stuff. It's great. So, uh, and really thank you for explaining it in a way that we can all understand because it is a very complicated subject. So thanks for that. Jerry, did we get any questions coming in as, as Gavin was talking? No, not yet. So so please, please people get typing. Um, but um, I, I've got a couple in hand um, to oh. ask. Um, so can you talk to me about how um, you work with other researchers? Do you, do you share variants? How, how are you working with other researchers to, to, to pool knowledge? Yeah, that's that's a really important uh, question. So we 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 share all all data. So all of our all of our patient data. There there were about one thousand six hundred patients from Moorfields Eye Hospital who who entered into the hundred thousand genomes project, for example. And so that data is shared uh, with about three thousand researchers across the world now. So researchers can register and access all of that data. So that, that data is completely shared. Um, it's, it's shared in a, a, a safe, anonymized way so that uh, no one can get back to patient data, but, uh, but they're able to do different research projects on that. And uh, if, we, if we find a new gene or a new variant that we don't understand, then we will share that in many different ways as well. So, we're part of, at Moorfields, we're part of uh, a European consortium. There are something like 24 groups across Europe, and we meet twice a year and share data of, uh, of new genes and new variants and, uh, and talk about how to, how to better understand these. And the key thing is to be able to find um, 
uh, more, more families affected by the same cause of their retinal dystrophy, because that gives us the confidence um, that it is a real finding and it's just not uh, it's not just a, a, a false positive that, that we that we always worry about that sort of thing happening. So identifying several people or several families affected by the same thing gives us the proof or the confidence that we're on the right track. So we do we do share with this European consortium and there are also um, other ways that we can share data. So there are gene sharing platforms that we use. So there's one that, that patients and families can access as well, which is called MyGene2, the number two. Um, and what that is, that's a, that's a way we can upload new candidate genes that we're interested in studying. And, that, and then that can be shared across the world with all, all registered users. And if anyone has the same gene and they've shared it as well, then then those two researchers will be put into contact to discuss that and to, to understand where they can, how they can take that forward. So there are lots of ways that we share and we do share as much as we possibly can in, at, at Moorfields for sure. Thank you. Um, question in the chat from, from Sue. Um, this is about RPGR genes. So my family has an X-linked RPGR with a mutation on ORF15. <laughs> Um, I understand there is a stage three clinic trial taking place. Um, is the sequencing important in terms of treatments rather than genetic testing? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, the, uh, the, sequence, the sequence is important. Sorry, I'm just reading the... Uh, yeah, the do not. <laughs> she apologises. She says, sorry, it's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, um, so yeah, the... the so to be able to access something like that, a clinical trial um, like that, the knowing the gene is essential, first of all. So, so having genetic testing um, before being recruited to a trial like that is, is essential. Now, uh, it, yeah, sadly, his, his RP is too advanced to take part or benefit, but uh, the, you know, the, the earlier that we can do the sequencing and the better we can understand the genetics of, of patients and individuals disease means that we, we you know, maximise the window of opportunity for being able to do treatments like, like the one that, that, that Sue mentions in RP, for RPGR. So we need to get to patients early and we need to, we need to turn the data around as quickly as possible. And so at the moment, the, the genetic testing service in the UK whole genome sequencing is quite new and uh and and the uk is kind of leading the world in in uh using whole genome sequencing for uh genetic testing and so that means that as we as we're learning that process um things have become a bit slowed down for clinical labs so being able to analyze that data and recruit enough clinical scientists to be able to to work on that genetic data is a struggle at the moment and that means uh, waiting times for patients is, is, is too long currently and so, uh, so uh, the NHS and the clinical labs are working very hard to improve that but, uh, but that's, that's another key point is that we need to be able to get the genetics done as quickly as possible so that, uh, so that we can maximise the opportunity for recruitment to clinical trials like that one. Thank you. Okay, question from Marilyn. How is gene therapy for retinal diseases administered? So uh, currently the, the RPE65 gene therapy is, uh, so it's a, a, a virus <clears throat> that contains the corrected copy of the gene and that's injected subretinally. So it's, a, it's an injection through the eye, the needle goes through the eye under the retina and, and the virus is injected there. Um, so I'm, I'm a geneticist. I would, I would never do that to a person, but it, it sounds <laughs> terrifying, but that's, that's, uh, that's how it's done for RPE65. And there may be, uh, as, as new gene therapies come, come about, there may be, uh, there may be new uh, methods of how to, uh, how to administer those. There may be intravitreal injection, which will be simpler because you don't have to get under the retina and, and that's a bit less complicated, but that's where we are now. Thank you. Um, so Edward's asking, as a patient in Newcastle, 
whose data is in the 100,000 Genome Project. Will our family's data be included in the more fields based research, please? Yeah, so, so we can see, we can see uh, every, every genome from every patient who was recruited to that study. Um, we, we don't know who those patients are, but we can see all of their genetic data. Um, and, and so what we do at Moorfields, um, because we're interested in inherited retinal disease genetics, then we will separate out all of the patients who recruited under that diagnosis for the, uh, for the, for the study. And there are about 3,000 of those, I think, across the whole UK. And so we'll do our analysis on all of those patient data and, and potentially find new causes of, of genetic disease in, in any one of those patients from anywhere in the UK. And then the way that it works from that point on is if we, if we find something of interest that, that we want to take forward, we'll then be able to contact the uh, clinical team who recruited that family to the study. And so we, we, we get in contact with Genomics England Genomics England get in contact with the clinical team. And then uh, if the clinical team um, respond and are interested in, in uh, being involved in that research study, they can contact us directly and we can, we can talk in more detail about that again uh, after that. So, so yeah, the, an the answer is uh, yes. Uh, your, your data is, is very much included in what we're doing. And uh, we are able to feed that back via your clinical team in Newcastle if we find it anything of interest. Thank you. Um, question from Andreas. Will it be possible to repair the gene in best disease at some point in how many years? Um, we've been funding work with Amanda Carr on best disease and I know she's working on gene editing so maybe I don't yeah, know that, how much you know about that. <laughs> so I, I actually met with Amanda Carr yesterday. Ah, <laughs> good. So we, we talked about this then. So yeah, lo lots of researchers are, are, are very keen to do this. So best, best one, the gene that causes best disease is the, so it's the fifth most common gene that we see in Moorfields Clinic. So it's a really, really important cause of disease that, that many people are working hard to, to try and correct. Now, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit different to RP65 in, in, in many ways, but the the principles should be similar in that uh, in the, uh, gene therapy is feasible and replacing uh, the defective copy of the gene with, a, with a, a, a functional copy of the gene should be possible. Now, the difference between BEST1 and RP65 is that BEST1 is, is uh, mostly a dominant disease and RP65 is mostly a recessive disease. So, we have to think a little bit differently about how we introduce corrected copies in, in, in those circumstances. What we need to do with best one is to, is to delete the damaged copy rather than add a corrected copy, if you, if you see what I mean. So, um, so that makes it a bit more complicated, but lots of people are interested in working on that. I think, you know, the, these things do take a long time. So, um, it's it's got to be it's got to be figured out in cells first. We've got to understand how it affects cells and and how it works in cells, and then and then move on to models and and organism mo models before we even think about injecting um, real patients with these things. But it is coming, but it will take a long time, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, there's one question from from Maureen about donated eyes after death. Um, I know a little bit about this. I don't know if you know, or do you want to quite mind trying to answer that one? Or oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so, so retina tissue is, is something that, that is, is a really useful thing for researchers to be able to access, to, to understand the structure of the retina and how different parts of the retina work and how different proteins are important in different cells of the retina. And it's not so. It's not something that we we have access to very easily at all. So, um, yeah. So the 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 limitations of of being able to understand how genes and RNAs and proteins are active in the retina, uh, we we're very much limited by not being able to access that tissue. So so donated eyes are important to lots and lots of different research projects, not just not just genetic research projects, but but. Mm -hmm. 
functional biology, cell biology, all sorts of stuff. So um, yes, it, it very much helps. Thank you. Um, I know they have to be har harvested is the word they use from the body within 24 hours. That's um, right, yeah. It, it does quite happen quickly because limitation. The, every, every, the tissue, the cells, the, the DNA, the, the genes, the RNA, the proteins all start to change quickly after, after death. So it does need to happen very quickly for that to be, for that to be useful, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you don't die in a hospital, I think that makes it logistically quite quite difficult. But um, we definitely need more donated eyes, and most of them go for um, corneal transplants. But the remaining rest yeah. of the eye can be used for research if people give consent. Um, so, question from Peter: How important is knowing what normal DNA is as a reference point? Yeah, Sounded like quite important. That, that is very, very, very important indeed. So what we have now is um, the uh, the human uh, reference genome, and it's it's on build number thirty eight. So this is the thirty eighth version of the of the normal DNA sequence. Um, and one one thing we've learned about that in in recent years is that it's not a very good reference genome at all. So since we've been able to do whole genome sequencing on more and more people, we, we are better understanding how poorly functional the, the reference genome is. And that's because it's based on the sequence of a very small number of people. I think it's 11 people or something like that. Oh, um, <laughs> and so it, it, what, it, what it doesn't do well is represent different ethnicities. Um, there are parts of it that, that aren't sequenced very well at all. And, uh, and it, it, it's not representative of the global human normal DNA sequence. And normal is a, a word that we should be careful about using, obviously. Um, and making one normal reference genome is, is not really possible. So there are, there are projects ongoing now um, there's there's a project called the Human Pan Genome Project, which is uh, taking place. Uh, it, it's led by people in California, um, and what that is aiming to do is to generate uh, long read based um, reference genomes, and to generate lots of those for different ethnicities, and to change the way that we look at normal DNA sequence. So so to treat it like a roadmap rather than a sequence. So there are you know, lots of uh, branch points where where the DNA sequence can change to a different reference in the human genome and to, to think about the genome in that way rather than just a string of letters. Um, and so being able to understand genetic disease um, is is limited because of our our ability to understand what the reference genome is, obviously. And so the, the, the better that that gets, the more advanced our understanding of human genetics in general gets, the better we'll be able to interpret variants um, from that reference genome. And so currently the, the biggest database of human genome data is, is something called NOMAD, um, which is uh, based in the, in the US at the Broad Institute in the US. And that uh, has data from about 140,000 um, cases, individuals across the world. So mainly focused on North Western European descendant genomes um, and not very well representing ethnicities uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, many East Asian and South Asian ethnicities aren't very well. Uh, represented in that so we need to do better with that as well but that is an amazing resource currently but it, it could be much much better okay, thank you um so question from louise my genetic test was in 2007 and she was told she had joins is there any benefit in updating a genetic test done quite a while ago so uh, probably not for something like Doin. So um, the, that's that's a, a genetic disorder that, that we understand quite well. The the, the spectrum of, of uh, variant that causes that disease is very limited. So um, so probably not for that. I think uh, I think you've probably got the answer, and I don't think that would change by by redoing genetic testing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are projects. Um, uh, around the NIHR in the UK, I think, who are recruiting uh, people who have had positive genetic testing in the past 
to to better understand the uh, the genetic background um, around that that genetic test. So the the not not specifically the variant that causes the disease, but but uh, genetic associations around that that uh, variant. So that might be of interest if you if you would be keen to take part in that the NIHR bioresource. I just uh, it's interesting because I have my genetic test funny enough because I've Stargardt's for the years. Um, and uh, it came back as obviously Stargardt's uh, on the correct gene, which I can never remember the name of, which is very bad in that I work for the Macular Society, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the BC. And um, but then there was two other variants as well, which 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 they didn't which didn't say what they were, they just highlighted that there were two other variants. So yeah. and, and and that's that's something that comes up quite often for a gene like ABCA4. So it, it is quite a big gene. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's about 130,000 uh, nucleotides long, the gene. Um, and uh, it's quite variable. And, and there are lots of variants in that gene that we don't understand very well. So there are variants that we think are associated with, with Stargardt disease, but we're not entirely sure about. There are variants that definitely are associated, but we don't understand how they are causing uh, a, a damaging effect on the protein. And so I think it's important that, that on a genetic report, you do include things like that. So the additional variants that may have been identified in, in your genetic testing, if there were any, because that's, that's, that will be useful going forward for, for clinical groups and, and researchers like me to be able to access that sort of data as we as we better understand what those variants may or may not be doing to the gene. So it's it's not uncommon that there will be more than two variants in a gene like ABCA4. But uh, the, what what you need for a positive genetic test is is two variants in ABCA4 to make a, a, a correct molecular diagnosis of that gene. Yeah, I, 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 I sort of allowed my test to go on for research as well, so you should have it somewhere. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> have we got any other questions, Jerry? No, no. Um, if we've got time, I, I just wanted to explore the ethnicity question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People have asked me, um, and I didn't really know the answer, I've certainly never seen it anywhere, Is, are any, any macular dystrophies particularly associated with, with different ethnicities? So we know that uh, we know that for for a gene like ABCA4, for example, there are there are variants um, within that gene that are very very much associated with different ethnicities. So there are variants um, that are that there's one particular mutation that's found in in somewhere in the region of about ten percent of individuals of, of Somalian ancestry, for example, um, and that's it's a very mild. Uh, variant and and even in even when there are two copies of that of that uh, variant in the gene, it may not actually cause disease on its own. It, it needs uh, a modifier to make it pathogenic. But uh, but yes, yeah, so different ethnicities have very very different uh, 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 groupings of variants in in genes that cause macular dystrophy for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no more questions in, in the chat, Colin. Marvellous. Well, that's all right. Uh, well, I don't want to get any more questions. Uh, so, um, so Jerry, what have you, do you just want to give your usual update then uh, of, of yes, research yes. things? Yes, yeah. happy to. Um, yeah. yeah, so the Macular Society, we have a, a growing research programme. We've um, recently decided on our new projects for 2023, um, and we have a total of 13 new projects. <laughs> In 2023, and there's a, there's several ones on macular dystrophies. Um, we'll, we'll be announcing those and giving people details in in the next few months. But um, I think there's at least two that on Stargardt disease. Um, so look out for those. Look out for information on our website um, and information in, in side view if you're a member. Um, just our normal um, advert for our research participant database. If people are interested in um, clinical research. Um, either being on a clinical trial, or we actually have an incredible number of opportunities coming through to us every day for people to take part in research in other ways other than being on a clinical trial. Researchers are really um, interested in having people um, advisors on their research, maybe on a panel, 
giving the, people, the researchers the benefit of their experience, helping design research, carry out research, report on research. Um, even sometimes sort of beyond the, the committee that, that runs the research as a co-investigator. Um, this is probably not very widely known as an opportunity for people if they're interested. Um, but we are going to be talking about it a lot more because we are literally every week getting people come at researchers and companies come to us and say, please, can you find us somebody with this condition who would be um, our expert person, our expert patient to help us um, manage our research and, and improve our research and give the best the benefit of their experience. Um, so if anybody's got any interest in doing that, please do come forward and, and contact us um, and sign up to the research database or just email research at maculasociety.co.uk. I should know that. .org. .org. .org sorry, .org. I'm yeah. confused. <laughs> yeah, research no, at maculasociety.org. There we go. Um, so, um, but we, we advertise opportunities on our website. Um, we advertise opportunities um, on social media. Um, directly through our peer support groups any way we think is, is going to work. Excellent. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you, as always. Um, so, Gavin, uh, really, really thank you for, for your session this evening. It's been incredibly interesting. So thank you for your time. We're always very grateful for, for you scientists coming along and telling us uh, in, in ways that we can all understand what's going on. So thanks very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent. OK, so uh, Gavin's uh, um, talk and presentation will be uh, up on, on YouTube and onto, our, onto the website fairly soon. Um, and I'm sure at some point, because you, you separated it really nicely, there'll be little podcasty things of it coming out as well, I would suggest. So that's really good. So it's, it'll be spread far and wide. So great. So thanks very much. Um, next month, we uh, have a, a special event, I'm going to call it, and we need your help. Um, because Jerry here and her, her colleague, Sarah, uh, potentially, um, know an awful lot about research and what's going on. Uh, one thing we've never done is a research Q&A, but to help Jerry out, and um, she would like some questions in advance. Um, so I've got to change a few things on the, web, on the webinar um, tomorrow morning. So after that point, if you would like to register, and when you get the email with registration, it will, um, there'll be... Um, if you've got any questions, please send it to uh, and the, in, within that email. So send question, email some questions in around research and bits and pieces. Uh, so Jerry and, um, and um, if it was QI, it would be the uh, be, be her minions in the background uh, looking at uh, for some of the answers that you have. That promises to be a really good, interesting session. Uh, so thank you, Jerry, uh, for, for offering to do that. Um, you uh, and, and then finally, uh, so that will be uh, next month on the last Thursday of the month, which again, I checked and I it's gone clear out of my head. Uh, I think it's the 24th, I think. Um, so, um, no, uh, that's not that's not that at all. That's a comedy night that I'm running. That's not that. So ignore that completely. Um, it's the 28th. That's what it is. So, um, yeah, great. So we've got that next month. So that'll be very interesting. Um, and all that leads me to do is say thank you to Gavin again. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and thank you to Jess for keeping an eye on everything in the background. And uh, just um, register out for the, for the next session as from tomorrow afternoon. Cheers, then. Thanks very much. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.